Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Welcome, dear reader, to Dispatches from the Armchair. There's so much news, and the world moves so fast. What are the big ideas and historical forces that are really shaping our world? Go deeper than the headlines with Dispatches from the Armchair. Pacific War Channel, where we cover the history of the entire Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. And I am here with my hostage. Yeah, that's me, Justin. Good to see you guys again. Glad to be here. And uh, we got another little episode to talk about. And yet again, it'll be over Zoom because we are living in a world of regulations within the province of Quebec. It's getting worse. Yeah, that's okay. I didn't want to go to this guy's house anyways. It kind of smells funny. Too many animals. So uh, we're doing this like this for now, but glad to be here. And uh, I enjoyed this episode because I actually understood most of it. You weren't just throwing out random Japanese names and ranks that nobody understood. So yeah, uh, certainly from the last episode, uh, I was going to say, um, for those who, you know, watch most of these episodes, they know that Justin is told to watch the episode of the week. He puts up a, you know, a few notes and shows up to this podcast, uh, tells me what he thought and usually dabbles into the economics of it. And, uh, last episode was brutal to say the least and very confusing so it became more of an episode of him asking me questions as to what the hell was going on and me answering yeah well this one was definitely a lot more clear and it's a topic that i think everybody or most people who have seen a certain movie which we will mention in a minute uh, are somewhat familiar with although i think you even covered a bit in your last episode that that movie was kind of muddled over a couple of different conflicts and people yeah. So it uh, yeah. kind of threw a few things together, but we definitely see the shadow of that movie in here. Definitely. And, uh, if you've yeah. seen, of course, we're talking about the famous The Last Samurai film starring Ken Watanabe and Tom Cruise, which is loosely based off of this week's episode, which was the Satsuma Rebellion. Yeah. And yeah, um, so it's, it's really convenient. I mean, anybody who's actually, you know, a long time listener audio listeners i'm thinking about you to this podcast knows that i'm stringing along all these events in a chronological order and they all have something to do with the pacific war it's like all of the hors d'oeuvres and the main course will be the war that starts in 1937 the boshin war was the last episode and it goes hand in hand with this one which is the satsuma rebellion the movie the last samurai actually merges both these both of these events into one sort of Basically, Tom Cruise is a, he's based off of a real character, a French military advisor during the Boshin War. And Ken Watanabe's character is more or less Saiko Takamori, who led the Satsuma Rebellion. Yeah. yeah. And you can see, I mean, when you strip it down to bare bones, this is almost a, this is almost just an uprising of disgruntled ex-employees to the government. <laughs> and uh, I, that I, yeah, basically. Now, now that's being very crass and it's, you know, not to make light of them because they did kind of get the shit end of the stick in this whole thing. You know, they but, certainly did. But Their yeah, you have the packages sucked. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was no golden handshake. I'll tell you right now, because they, you know, you go from samurai, which, you know, I think it's pretty safe to assume we're in the upper echelon of Japanese society back in the day. It depends. You know, there but, were samurais in poverty during this period that, we're in debt to merchants. It sucked for them, but yes, yeah, samurai traditionally were the upper. No, but line. as compared to a quote unquote commoner or anything like that, or just some basic, uh, fact, not factory worker, but a laborer, you know, the, 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 they were a higher class of society and going from that to not only having their whole 
culture nearly abolished, but getting their rations and their income just absolutely chopped at the knee. Certainly. And uh, I, I can definitely understand a little bit of the revolt in them. So uh, maybe we'll start this off before we get too derailed. We'll just explain, like, how did this kind of come about? Like, what are we talking about here? Why was there discontent? Why are we talking about angry samurai? So we, we mentioned the Boshin War. There was a, a major war in 1868 to 1869 in which two factions emerged. One, to really summarize this because it got so confusing, one was pro-Shogun. One was not for the Shogun. They wanted to dissolve the Shogun, and it was for petty reasons, like they just wanted to get rid of the Tokugawa family. They wanted to dissolve the position. They really they wanted to put the emperor back in charge, quasi-like. And, you know, it was what is now called the, the Meiji Restoration that occurred after. Right. Not, not Meiji. And I know people have been giving me a lot of, a lot of heck. Yeah, I mispronounce a lot of things. And uh, yeah, so the Boshin War concludes. Uh, Saigo Takamori is one of the main victors. He's the quote-unquote leader of Satsuma Domain, which becomes a prefecture after all this. And he supports the new government, which is under the emperor. And this new government is all about reforming, like we said in our episode on the Meiji Restoration. And a lot of things change in Japanese society. They grab from the West, but they try to also take from their own cultural past uh they throw away a lot of chinese stuff interestingly enough and anyways one thing that happens that starts off kind of this fuse into a bomb is they want to equalize the classes so they want to get rid of the class system that's been in japan for man, a long time and it is uh known actually i'm not sure if this is specifically just in japan or if this is a chinese term but it's known as shino kosho and she means warrior no means farmer ko means craftsman and sho means merchant so these are the four groups that make up japanese society and they are not equal we're talking like you know modern day india with the caste system which is really i mean i won't go too far into it but it's striking that that still exists kind of today so they dissolve the class system and everyone becomes equal. But the warrior class, quote unquote, the samurai, who were, like you said, Justin, at the top of the epsilon, you know, they lost their position in society and they also lost special privileges, which were, you know, to carry a sword. They were the only ones allowed to have weapons, uh, depending on the period. They had top knots for their hair to show the mm. symbol of their warrior hood. And they were allowed to kill any commoner that disrespected them, much like the musketeers of France. They would kill people in cafes who looked at them wrong. Yeah. And, to put uh, that into yeah. modern day perspective, imagine somebody walking into the US and abolishing gun rights completely. You'd have a few upset people. Kicking our guns. Yeah. So it's... Uh, but it, it's not just about the, the weapon itself or what they could do with it. It was a status symbol at the time. Oh, funny enough, a big reason why they wanted samurais to not carry swords anymore was because when you went to, let's say, a bureaucratic meeting, uh, usually these warriors would bring their swords in with them. And it goes without saying, they would actually threaten other bureaucrats. And if someone was voting on something, a, it would not be unheard of to threaten physically the person. And uh, this would actually occur a lot in World War II, just uh, in the 1930s and 20s. Like Japanese would assassinate their colleagues just to get up in the world and stuff. It, it's uh, it's an interesting yeah. aspect. And and I'm sure you'll get into the movie itself more when you do your review of it. But isn't there a small scene in the movie where they touch on that? I believe yeah. he enters the emperor's chambers and he's asked to surrender his weapons and he refuses. Uh... Very much. The movie, and I mean, I... I'll disclose here. I will be there's a the next episode is a, a film review of the Last Samurai. The movie is not you would say very historically accurate, but the thing that it really did well was aspects of the historic period or periods before it. It kind of looks more Edo than than Meiji sometimes, but uh, there's a lot of love and care to like small details. And one of them, yes, he walks into the room and he's carrying a sword and he's told by his rival Umura 
you know, you have to put the sword away. This is illegal. You know this. And, you know, he makes a stand and he says, if the emperor wants to take my sword, I give it to him freely. What this was in reference to in the actual history is that Saigo Takamori, when he did this rebellion we're going to talk about, he wore his official military uniform as a symbol that he was still loyal to the emperor. A very important thing when you are uh, trying to rebel against a government. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anyways, the samurai, as we said, they lost their, their special privileges. But it goes without saying, they also lost a much more important thing, their economic livelihood. There was 1.9 yep. million samurai at the beginning of the Meiji period who were living off of you know, stipends given to them by the government. Because the government, you know, uh, originally in the Edo period, they would pay the samurai in koku, which is like a, an amount of rice that would feed one person for a year. So a certain amount of koku was given to the daimyo, the leader of a han, and the daimyo would pay the samurai in a certain amount of koku. That was like the currency. Yep. But uh, I mean, in this new world, they had to go to stipends, which makes sense. They were modernizing. But... Uh, this is extremely expensive. You can imagine you have 1.9 million samurai and they're basically unemployed for a while. They're looking for work in this new world and you're just kind of paying them a universal basic income. And, you know, we're living in COVID, you know, you can really, you, you have an image of how this looks right now. And uh, yeah. Well, not just that, but when you have a large population that basically is paid in food, which literally is, you know, bringing, you know, bringing home the bacon or uh, putting food on the table. Uh, when, you, when you take a significant chop in that, it, it, it's going to cause problems. Oh, I'm just going to change the photos as I go along. I keep forgetting about that. There we go. Mm. And uh, so it goes without saying something needed to change. So the government said, okay, at the beginning, um, this is really expensive. We'll slowly, we're going to gradually tax these stipends. So they do. That doesn't work. It goes on for a while. And by 1876, excuse me, they decided, okay, we're going to make an offer to you, ex-samurai. We'll convert your stipends into uh, bonds. You know, part of the government, it's, it makes sense. Uh, it's a good ploy and it, uh, it helps a little bit. Unfortunately, what happened is most of these samurai lost 10 to 75 percent of their total income as a result of this bond procedure then what the government did next is they made it mandatory to convert their stipends into bonds so the samurai had no more choice so you have a bunch of ex-samurai who you know they they found positions mostly in the new military and they found positions in like uh, education any institutions you can think of a lot of them became businessmen a lot of them the majority did very well but we always have a minority group, part of them, that didn't pick themselves up. They couldn't find a place in society and they're jobless, they're unemployed. Many of them are ridden by poverty because they're, you know, they're lent money from who God knows who <laughs> and they have no purpose in life. These are disaffected samurai. They're broken yep. men. And you can only imagine what people like this might do to your country. It's very dangerous. Yeah, well, now my question was, he, as, he started, uh, as he started building up these military schools and started gathering people, was he openly advertising like, come here, we're going to rebel against the government? Or was it no, more no. of like a cult sect kind of thing where they were all there and they just slowly all started, quote unquote, agreeing that the government needed to go? So what uh, Justin is referring to is Saiko Takamori, he will take notice to the, the plight of these unemployed samurais, and he actually finds them a purpose by building these academies that are military academies. They, uh, they train in weapons, training tactics, uh, specifically in artillery. That was something they were famous for. And the, the Chinese classics, as any good military would in Asia at this time. And it was really to give them purpose. Uh, he was not... Saigo wasn't the one who wanted to rebel in the first place. They actually persuaded him. We'll get to there soon. But before that, let's, let's go back to the position of these samurai. Because this wasn't enough to tip the scales yet. You see, the samurai, they, we have a group of unemployed samurai who will become the rebels, quote unquote. But the means to allow them to rebel has not been made yet. Now, what else, what else happens in history is in 1869... Uh, an envoy was sent to Korea. 
because we had a new emperor and the emperor more importantly was in control of japan uh which was enacted basically by the motion war so they went to the korea they sent an envoy and they gave a seal that and i do not speak any of these languages so excuse me it was using the character ko rather than taekun and the difference in character was reserved for the Chinese emperor. So they were referring to their new Japanese emperor, Meiji, as being an equal to the Chinese emperor because of the difference of characters they were using. So when the Koreans read this, they read, oh, you have an emperor and you're telling us he is at the same level as the Chinese emperor, but the Koreans were a tributary state to the Chinese emperor. So the Japanese basically, quote unquote, said, hey, you're under our boot now and you're gonna be a tributary to us too. And that's insulting, obviously. But more importantly, this meant that Korea was literally stuck in the middle of two tigers. And Korea wanted to stay with the tiger they knew, China. So they said, we don't know you, go, go away. They just told them, go away. We're not going to even accept your envoy. <laughs> so this led all the Japanese thinkers to have a legendary debate, which was the Sikanron debate. And there was a proponent who said, they should have a military expedition against the Koreas for this unbelievable insult to the Japanese emperor. And it was led by our friend Saigo Takamori. Now, Saigo Takamori wanted to invade Korea, but he did. And this is scholarly arguments. This is what people think. Saigo Takamori saw disaffected samurai, they're unemployed and they have no purpose. And he said to himself, you know, we're modernizing right now. And he agreed with a lot of the modernizations that were going on, even if it was hurting the samurai class. He understood why they needed to be done. He didn't agree with all of them, but a lot of them he did, especially for the military. Like conscriptions, for example, they were conscripting commoners into the military. So the samurais no longer had a monopoly on being the warriors, which really aggravated the samurais. But a lot of them, you know, they bit into their cheek and they joined with the commoners. Saigo has this in mind, we have all of these unemployed samurai, they have no purpose and they could destroy this country. If they rebel, they would ruin everything and we couldn't control them. They know how to fight with modern weapons. Don't think of these samurai as just, you know, katana wielding guys. That's not, they, they do know how to use guns, a lot of them. Like they could have absolutely made a mess of Japan and a lot of revolts were happening, big ones and small ones. And he said, why don't we do a military expedition in Korea? We're going to send all of these disenfranchised samurai over there. So they're away from us. They're not going to cause any troubles. We're paying them. So they, they get money. They got a purpose. And you know what? Let them go rule Korea in the old way we used to. And we'll modernize over here. And then we'll shake hands at the end, you know, because yep. they're out of the way. Everybody's happy. It's actually a good idea. If you think about it from a strategic point of view. Hmm. But Justin, why didn't they do it? Could you guess? You know what? I'm not really sure. Japan was modernizing, meaning it was nowhere capable of invading a country like Korea. I mean, not that Korea was militarily stronger, but yeah, I Japan couldn't possibly do it. Really? And, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they had a lot of weapons. They could have hurt Korea. Korea also has China as its backer, mind you. So China would be involved at some point. And Japan had invaded uh, Korea. For those maybe notice on Netflix, there's a series that just came out called Age of Samurai, which talks about this very fascinating point in history. So the Japanese are currently spending all their money modernizing, getting railroads, doing all this stuff. They don't have money to actually, even though they are putting a lot of money into the military, they cannot possibly afford to invade as much as they wanted to. A lot of them did want to. And they had to tell Saigo, no. And Saigo went as far as to literally say he would be, he would give his life. He would go over as an envoy to Korea. He would get drunk, act like a complete asshole until the Koreans assassinated him, giving a legitimate reason for Japan to go and invade. He offered this on the table and they said no. And they probably explained to him like, look, you know, as well as any of us, all of our money's tied into all these things that we're doing, you know, with the economy and all that. And we, we can't train a military fast enough to do this right now. It's like, it's out of the cards. So Saigaru, he resigned. He just resigned from government and he went into retirement in Satsuma. 
And as you were saying, Justin, it was in Setsuma in his retirement where he opened up the Shigako, these uh, military academies. And these military academies, like I said, they uh, trained weapons, tactics, artillery, Chinese classics, and they allowed all the ex-samurai who came to them to wear their top knots and carry their swords so that they could feel like they were samurais again, you know, give them a, a sense of empowerment because they had been, these were broken men. The problem with these academies was they grew. There was 132 branches apparently when, it, when they were at the largest and Saigo had accidentally created a paramilitary force in his prefecture. Yeah, but it's... I'm surprised that the the, the emperor, the, the state didn't give more attention to it previously because they must have known it was happening. Oh, they absolutely Or maybe had it word. wasn't perceived as a threat? It was, uh, I would say, the most threatening aspect of this was um, Saigo Takamori is not the leader of the prefecture. He's a high-ranking official in the government. The actual, quote unquote, it's uh, the governor, we'll call it, of Satsuma, ends up basically telling the government that they've seceded. The Satsuma has kind of outgrown the central government and they're not listening to them anymore. So as anyone would imagine, uh, the Mechae central government was horrendously terrified, really angry. So they sent 57 spies. And uh, these were like secret police to go spy on the academies and actually find out what's going on. Okay. I actually, myself, as much as I want to say, you know, I'm a historian, I can't know every single aspect of this. I didn't specialize specifically in this time period, despite what people might think. I talk about the major restoration so much. Um, allegedly, from the reports that I got, the, some of the spies were caught by the students of these academies and the students tortured them. And the students said that one of these officers told them that he was sent there to assassinate Saigo Takamori. I don't have any evidence to back this up. I haven't read into it too much, but I think the students might, they could have made this up to be honest, because it, it does seem unreasonable that a figure like Saigo Takamori, who's one of the three great nobles of Japan, a very, very respected individual. I don't think, um, I don't think the state was going to assassinate him at this point. Anyways, quote unquote, students interrogate some of these spies that they capture. They say that uh, they're going to kill Saigo. So they rebel, they go all through Satsuma and they raid all the arsenals. So they take all the guns and weapons that they can get their hands on. And they, this is a fish, you know, it's effectively, they've started a rebellion and they demands, you know, us of Saigo, Hey, lead us. You, you know, you're the guy teaching us these academies. You're such a great prominent leader. You're going to be the leader of this rebellion. And a reluctant Saigo says yes, because he understands their plight. Really? Yeah, he, uh, I mean, you hear that a lot, that the best leaders are the ones who don't want to lead, kind of. Yeah. So I there could be some propaganda. It could be that he was, he could have been a puppet master, for all I know. Maybe he wanted this. But well, That's also possible. But his actions when he was given the job of leading this rebellion, he put on the official military uniform that he had resigned, you know, from to show support for the emperor. And he told everybody, he made a proclamation that he was actually marching on Tokyo because he saw corruption in the government and that he was going to ask questions of the government when marching upon Tokyo, kind of like Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. It's actually comparable in a lot of ways. Uh, so to him, he was, laying out grievances not to the emperor but to the corrupt politicians of which there was there absolutely was corrupt politicians as in any government yeah there kind of always is yeah one of the guys that uh saigo didn't get along with amura excuse me amura was uh invested in rail railroads and saigo said that they're a waste of money he said the money should be spent on the military which Saigo was wrong, by the way, if <laughs> railroads are important. And mm -hmm. uh, Amura was one of the guys that was like a, a major rival to him when it came to, um, I, I guess you'd say the bureaucracy. Amura gets killed by a bunch of ex-samurai in an inn. He actually runs away from them and he hides in a bath. Uh, but his wounds, uh, the bath water was dirty and it got into his wounds. He ended up dying. 
That's a little messed up. Not oh, the nicest the way to go. Story. But uh, what was I going to ask? So he gets chased down. He dies. What exactly happens to uh, what exactly happens to the rest of the rebellion, quote unquote, after that? So the rebellion says that they're going to march on Tokyo. So as you can imagine, during this time period, a march. Uh, yes, there are horses, of course, but a lot of your troops are walking. So they have to walk all the way over to Tokyo from uh, Satsuma. Actually, it would help if I put up a map. There we go. Uh, okay. Hope it's easy to see. It's a little fuzzy on my end. You can see this is Kagoshima and Satsuma. So he has to go north. So on the way lies other prefectures that are absolutely not your allies because they're not part of this rebellion. So he runs into, you know, um, a particular prefecture on the way, which is Kumamoto. And there's a legendary castle there, which is Kumamoto castle. And okay. it's being defended actually by a friend of Saigo Takamori. So when he, he's fought with uh, Ma major general Tani Tetake. Uh, who doesn't have a large force. Uh, it's mostly, uh, it's a lot of policemen with some soldiers that he has. And he has to defend this fortress against a pretty large force. It's like 10,000 ex-samurai. And we're talking about guys who've been trained by Saigo. So one of the great military leaders in all the modern weaponry. Because Saigo had close relations with the British. He had Armstrong field guns, howitzers, everything. Like they're, they're using really powerful stuff. Despite what the last samurai would have you believe. Um, they weren't just rolled with swords. We'll say that much. Okay. And uh, so they end up in a siege. I mean, I don't want to talk so much about the war because there's so many battles and such. But this one was important. Because a, a large part of this war was it was the siege at this legendary Kumamoto castle. And it's it's bad. It's really bloody. Um, Saigo thinks he was going to take it over immediately. He actually thought the doors were going to get unlocked for him. He thought the guy was just going to like give up. Guy doesn't give up. Uh, puts a bloody warfare. It's a uh, it's trench warfare, kind of close to what you would expect from World War One, to be honest. Which might make people go really like with these kinds of weapons and that. Yeah, it's it's almost getting there to the 1900s. It's it's sophisticated. I mean, there's types of kind of not landmines, but there are kind of bombs and stuff going on too here. It's scary. And uh, it's bloody. But as Sai goes um, sieging for a long period of time, this castle, samurai who were just, you know, disaffected in the area actually flee to his cause and he doubles his numbers. Yeah, that's what's really scary. So when the Meiji state sees this, they're like, oh my God, this rebellion is widespread. Like it's a cancer. We need to kill it right now. They end up right. sending, you know, uh, some of their best, honestly, some of their best generals and i mean i won't go into all the different battles but more or less i go just continuously is uh, he's fighting the larger forces that have more equipment than him and he he loses and he starts to lose battles and he's on the run and he goes on the run for a long time really yeah and he uh he's forced to do guerrilla warfare huh so while he's on the run, you can imagine he's got like a few thousand guys with him. He leaves like pockets of a hundred just to attack the supply lines of the enemy. And uh, the big, what ends up happening is he loses one really particular battle and he ends up having to run back uh, to his prefecture of Satsuma. And while he's on the run, the military sails all the way across, meets him because uh, in the Satsuma domain, where he's from, the major capital that's um, Kagoshima, excuse me. Uh, the military force tries to get there before him. So he basically gets trapped and he ends up on uh, Mount Shiroyama, which overlooks um, the city. And okay. he, uh, that's where he makes his last stand. And he knows huh. he's dead at this point. Uh, they all know that they're, they have no hope. Right. So they kind of squashed it with that. Now, yes. what happened to uh, what happened to all the modernization and the samurai after he lost this rebellion? Because obviously, that's part of what he was fighting for. But well, it's um, it's actually quite interesting because 
and I don't say, I didn't have time in the episode to actually say this, uh, nor did I even have time to show some of the pictures. Oh my God, I have to control my pictures. Okay, so that picture right there is supposed to represent him on top of um, Shiroyama overlooking what would be like the city and the bay and the um, forces coming in on the ocean. Right. But um, when he died, uh, just before they, they defeated the samurai, they were using propaganda like they were chasing rats. So they were treating these ex-samurai like these are anti-reformers, you know, they're filth. They're beneath the Meiji state. They were actually treating Saigo like they were critically saying horrible things about him and his men. And this is a guy that was, you know, top, top tier government. Yep. Highly, highly respected, highly revered. So, so kind of went from yeah. one way to the other. You, you imagine like uh, today, uh, you have a freedom fighter in your country. Uh, the government doesn't support the freedom fighter. Government says a bunch of, you know, bad stuff about the freedom fighter. But the people in the surrounding areas close to the freedom fighter, they see it differently. And now they're questioning their government. So when Saigo Takamori died, the government got a lot of backlash, quite a lot, because, I mean, you have to imagine these Japanese people, yes, everything's modernizing, all these cool things are happening, all this, but you just basically stamped down on a traditional hero and someone who was representing traditions, because Saigo Takamori, in essence, like if you watch The Last Samurai, it's, they kind of like make it seem like he was fighting to keep some traditions alive, like traditions were being thrown away. Right. It's not exactly like that because the Meiji Restoration, yes, they're taking Western ideals, but they're also, it's, it's Fukuko. They're taking their antiquity, their ancient culture, and they're trying to intertwine it at the same time. It's a fusion. So it's not like they were throwing away all their traditions. Yes, they were trying to get rid of the samurai class. But as soon as they killed him, they realized, wow, a lot of people saw him as a, a hero. And of course, because in their culture, he died the most honorable death you can possibly, you know, like it's legend. His, his death is legendary. It was like 500 samurai left by the end of it. They charge. He commits seppuku and they die like 60 to one odds. Like it, they were outnumbered everything. It's, it's unbelievably like, it's like a dream. Yeah. Yeah. It was a real 300 story. Exactly. Yeah. Japanese people even spread rumors that he's not dead. That he's hiding. And he's going to come out of retirement. And I'm talking in like the 1890s. They're talking about this. He's going to come back and he's going to save everybody. They're, they're oh, crazy. Okay. Yeah, they're crazy. They love him. He's Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a tinfoil hat theory, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they love him. He represents Japanese spirit. Like he represents okay. the spirit of their culture. So the government was getting slammed for this, you know. They realized they're like, wow, uh. We dissolved this class, but everyone loves this class. It represented so much for the people, particularly uh, the Bushido code. You know, that's right. very important for the samurai. The government eventually, um, here, I just want to find the appropriate date before I miss it, because I know people will come after me. It takes a, it, it takes a while for the government. 1889, okay, it's February the 22nd, 1889. They apologize. Oh, not apologize they they dub saigo takamori as being the true last samurai basically they make a monument for him and they really like they showcase him and then they say that the new government nationalistic policy is going to utilize the bushido code they're going to intertwine it and they're going to make everybody live like samurai so everybody right. in japan is going to have this national compulsion now they're going to they're all going to be part of this which you know is like a complete 180 from what the government was kind of doing it's kind of funny when you think about it and i know if there's any japanese listeners i'm butchering this it's it's not really like this and i'm generalizing but for western audiences it's a, like it's a little bit easier just to like simplify it like this because technically you know the government the whole time is taking into consideration like the antiquity and that but I mean, for people who, who from the Western world, they see the last samurai and that's more what it looks like. I mean, at the end of the film, you even see it. Tom Cruise, he's like holding the sword to the emperor. Who, There's no way that would have happened. And, and the emperor asks him, like, how did he die? And he goes, I'll tell you how he lived. Like, you know, it's like the samurai live on. And they do. After this, you know, we call it uh, the last stand of the samurai and that Saigo Takamori was the last true samurai. But the Bushido Code and 
being a samurai quote unquote kind of exists even up to the end of world war ii huh it it gets really disgusting so if anything he maybe not fully but he kind of accomplished what he was after ironically ironically he did and i think i even ended the episode if i remember correctly it's like saigo takamori i can't i can't believe he didn't know it was futile what he was doing just based off the pure numbers and he was fighting for grievances against the government because he was a supporter of the reforms that were going on not all of them but he had a real issue with these samurai being left behind because it's a class that he came from you know uh Saigo Takamori, for example, was a, a hurt person. He was injured and overweight. And he still was, you know, retaining this class just because he was a victor. But like all the other samurai, if he was an average Joe, he would have been completely screwed. Just like them. Maybe that's really? why. You know, if you think about it, like he knew he would have had it rough if he wasn't uh, a prestigious leader. Huh. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Got to fight the good fight sometimes, right? Yeah, and you know all the uh, these podcasts that we do, which are excellent. Thank you, Justin, for joining them. I noticed that uh, we go really hardcore in the academics, this and that, but uh, I really like to spitball and like use these times to actually like tell the audience other things. And I, I forgot at the beginning. I wanted to mention this to the audience. I'm going to be doing something different for these podcasts for the audio listeners. Um, for those who actually didn't know, uh, most of the, the event podcast that you get that actually are just me alone explaining a historical event like the Measure Restoration or the Setsuma Rebellion. These are episodes on YouTube. So I write a script, I do a YouTube episode and I basically just use the audio. I might edit like a few things and then I create an audio podcast later or sometimes before. Sometimes I put the podcast out before. I realized that I need to do something for the audio listeners because they're growing significantly and I'm quite shocked. Thank you. Um, I, I guess maybe podcasting might have been a better angle than YouTube. And I was trying to think of a way to give you more. So what I'm going to do is during my process, I usually end up writing a script that's about five times larger than it's supposed to be. Like for instance, uh, one of the last scripts was uh, at the beginning, the rough draft is I think 12, 13 pages long. And I have to get it to about four pages for a 15 minute episode, which sucks i lose a lot and uh, i don't like doing it but i have to because youtube that's the way it is people aren't so eager to watch my 45 minute episodes just like justin was crying about as well so people no idea what you're talking about they were fun so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna take the rough drafts that i start off with and i'm gonna keep those and i'm going to make those the audio version of these podcasts so you are going to get 45 i don't know maybe even an hour long and I'm going to do it like Dan Carlin. I'm going to derail here and there from my scripts and like talk about contemporary things or make like, you know, funny jokes and that just give it some more livelihood and you'll get the really in-depth look at it. But if you want visual representation and a shorter format, you'll go on YouTube because it's more or less I'm aiming at about 15 minutes for these episodes. Uh, to give an example, I'm done part one of the first Sino-Japanese War and it ended up being 10 pages long and I immediately tried to summarize it and I ended up with 11 pages. So I messed up. <laughs> so I'm going to keep that and I'm going to make that the first of these podcasts that I'm talking about. But the YouTube episode definitely will be brought down to about 15 minutes because it's only part one of maybe a three-parter at this point because, wow, the Sino-Japanese War is a landmine to walk upon when you're trying to be non-biased. I'm trying to give credit to both China and Japan and even Korea in the middle. And it's just very difficult. And it actually has a lot to do with our current episode. Yeah, well, still, I don't mind an episode that has a little meat on the bones. It's just very hard for an, somebody with a non-historian background to follow all the names, dates, and classes and factions that uh, that are involved in these because you know we're going through so many different time periods we're going through so many different countries area regions leaderships regimes that uh well as far as i'm concerned it gets very muddled but i do i still do like following the the conflict in general leading up to 
the Pacific War, which I promise, guys, we'll get to at some point. Might oh, be yeah. in 10 years from now, but we'll hit it eventually. Uh, Channel's not named that for nothing. I, I put out a poll not too long ago on YouTube asking people uh, four que- Like I gave four choices for uh, a special podcast. Uh, I believe the choices were Battle of Singapore, Battle of Hong Kong, Letty Golf. I don't know if it's something involving the Burma campaign, but um, I have another friend who everyone has seen another podcast. If you're a long time listener named Eric, he has been reading up on the battle of Hong Kong and he is coming probably, I think some point this week to do a special podcast just on the battle of Hong Kong. So that's actually going to touch upon the real Pacific war, which I know people are probably really gearing for um, <laughs> myself included. I got myself into a hole. I actually was halfway thinking about renaming the channel 19th century chinese japanese relations at this point but uh yeah it's coming uh, we, we we promise guys it's not a clickbait title it's just a a future seeing our title oh and for any of my mandarin speaking audience all of my mispronunciations of your names events and places a certain individual has come forward and he is very very thorough with giving me uh, an entire Excel file on how to pronounce everything. And I am being put on the spot to learn and I will be learning. And he's going to be doing a podcast with me soon. It's supposed to be on the Taiping rebellion mostly, but I think we're going to go into just the Chinese language and, you know, more of a general, it's going to be a Chinese cultural podcast. Uh, He himself is Chinese Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited. I hope it actually branches out into more things because I don't, obviously I, I can't speak <laughs> Mandarin as I'm sure you're very much aware. And I'm quite embarrassed learning how I was supposed to pronounce a lot of words. My God, some of them are really bad now that I've been dwelling into this file learning. And uh, that'll be coming soon as well. Uh, I think we'll be filming something next Saturday. So a few days after this airs, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun and I hope it becomes something actually even bigger because it's been my dream to have a weekly podcast where it's not like me retelling kind of the, the weekly story, more of a, you know, a little bit of history, a little bit of contemporary, man, even some gaming and anime would be nice because I'm an otaku and I'd love to talk anime. Well, at some point when we get past the meat of these episodes too, we can always, uh, we could always have the the audience leave comments on any historic event that they'd like us to research and look up, and we could just do always, a quick yeah. uh, do do a quick one day hit on it, and then just throw it out there for discussion. If we get, uh, for example, Eric or any of the other historians you know in there to just kind of throw what they know into the melting pot, Absolutely. and just have a little chit chat about it, because uh, like I said, I don't mind learning about these events, and a lot of them are very are very economically inclined. You know, they mold how our world works today from a market standpoint and all these things. So it's, uh, it's cool to learn about. It's, uh, it's really fun. Yeah. I, I remember just before doing this podcast, cause Justin is quite the economics guy. I tried to look myself as kind of like, if the, you know, looking at this event, the before and after effects, like how much of this cripple the, you know, the Medche government's uh, purse and it's actually, it's quite a lot. Uh, I was surprised to find out that the government was hurt so much. They had to go off the gold standard. And this is what forced them into a paper currency. They had to, you know, in, inflation hit them. Yep. Yeah. It's, well, that's, uh, that's a big part of what you said it being kind of a 300 rebellion, you know, or is that uh, for such a small force, they, they, they caused so much of a ruckus that they were actually able to put a big dent big big dent in the government's bank you know and hang on i i have some of the notes here and cost them a total of 420 million yen if i'm reading that number right which is uh eight million four hundred thousand pounds which uh eight million four hundred thousand pounds well in canadian money that must be like a gajillion that that yeah that's uh no, but when when you date that back to the 1800s, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, that's it's... a big chunk of change. And bear in mind, you know, we've talked so much about how Japan was only 
they they weren't one of the top economic powers yet back then they were building they were building very very fast they were expanding very quickly but you take that dent out of a country's pocket and especially since this again like china this isn't the only rebelling they're fighting they're butting heads with china they're butting heads with korea now with all this uh with all this other nonsense so the their military force needs a lot of funding and needs a lot of backing but just this one internal rebellion which was relatively small so to speak really put a dent in their wallets but yeah. The good news of this is, again, like we've gone through in other episodes, Jap- Japan's production was just going huge at this time. Oh, yeah. I mean, their, uh, just the size of their merchant fleet went up like six or seven fold between 1875 and 1900, roughly. They went from 25, 26 uh, merchant ships to like 170 something. Modern so that, ships, too. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, if, if you're moving that much goods, you know, it means that your country is flourishing, which, is, like we said, around 1900 is really when Japan started being one of the big world powers at that time for production uh, and still is to this day in a lot of markets. So it's, it cost them a lot of money, but I think, I think in the long run they're able to sustain it because their production's grown so much. I mean, yes, they had to leave the gold standard but you know you talk about modernizing and most of the world was going away from the gold standard to begin with or started to at this time so uh, i think that was partly out of necessity but partly just out of okay it's time to be done with this and let's you know let's have our own currency so that's uh and uh i mean what Kind of what's ironic about this is uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that Saigo Takamori, he was advocating for an expedition uh, against Korea and they couldn't because they didn't have the means. When the government fought Saigo, their military got training because remember, this is a war. So all the men that ended up beating Saigo Takamori and his forces, they got training, they got armed and equipped. And guess what? this led into an invasion of Korea. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of, it's really ironic when you think about it, the guy that was advocating gets defeated and it kind of led to uh, an expedition against Korea. I mean, technically they, you know, the Japanese weren't trying to invade Korea. The Sino Japanese war was against China. And it's a lot of, I mean, I'm not going to go too much into it. It's a lot of accidents that kind of just forced it to happen. But uh, Japan yeah, whoops, was, we invaded your country. Sorry. Didn't mean to land here. I don't Wrong exit. I'm, I don't even know what I'm going to name the episode, but I had some ideas for titles. And one of them was like uh, Little Brother Beats Up Big Brother because China's technically always been historically Big Brother throughout this. And Little Brother Japan, um, not, not only does, does he beat China, he embarrasses, humiliates China, who's already gone through so much embarrassments with the opium wars, the Taiping rebellion. There's going to be a boxer rebellion. It's 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 going to get really bad for uh, for China for a while, and China's going to crack like an egg, and it's going to have its own revolution and become uh, the Republic of China. It's going to leave the Qing Dynasty. Yep. Yeah, well, that's you know we've touched on that in a few previous episodes. The fact that China just keeps getting hit from kind of any and all angles. Yeah, it and... sucks for China. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not having a good day. This is a, uh, <coughs> for lack of a better term, gangbang on China. And uh, it's not, not, not in the fun sense either. So You got Britain, France, and then America, the ones who kind of kick open the door on China. And then, I mean, the Germans and the rest kind of pour in after, you know, everything's said and done, and they do their damage. But the Japanese... It's a particular stab in the back when you think about it because the Japanese take advantage of a lot of the situations and they like they stamp their foot down on Big Brother. And Big Brother and Little Brother, they're not supposed to have horrifyingly bad relationships. For a long time, China and Japan had a great relationship, although China always kind of was like, I'm the big one, I'm, you know, you're the tributary to me. And Japan really, I mean, this goes into really big politics and to this day, Japan, China, these relations are uh fun <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh, it gets awful for them yeah well. yeah i guess uh i have no idea i didn't time this out 
I guess that's enough for this episode. Yeah, well, like we said, next episodes when we get into the Sino Japanese word, there's going to be a lot more meat on the bone, so we'll have a little bit more uh, oh, yeah. discussion topics in that. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see your movie review too. I want to see it and see where you kind of uh, where you kind of think they were accurate and where you think they went wrong. Yeah, just to let people know, because uh, probably anybody who's watching this on YouTube knows who History Buffs is. And of course, someone that inspired me to join YouTube. I, I watched his episode before making my own The Last Samurai. So I tried to do very different stuff. I didn't want to copycat. I didn't want to do anything. Even like the cynical historian who also did his own review on this. I, I really tried to do something different. And uh, I really hope people end up watching it because it took me a hell of a long time to edit. And I'm in uh, week one now of copyright infringement fighting over it. So, yeah. Oh, boy. But, yeah, it's been fun. And uh, we'll end it there. We're going to see you guys next time. Thank you, Justin, again. It's been a pleasure as always. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll get into some good stuff in the next one. This has been the Pacific War Channel. Please like and subscribe and leave comments. I need comments. Over and out.